This is why everybody's launching a stablecoin because they've realized that uh, with all the other products, DEXs and lending, you're at the mercy of LPs and you have to pay them the vast majority of the revenue. The stablecoin is the only one uh, where the protocol uh, can direct the revenue to different things. So uh, this is what everybody's coming to the realization for. This is why they're all launching a stablecoin. And I think, yeah, everything's just going to be vertically integrated in the end. You know, everything's open source code. Uh, and I think this is ultimately a good thing for the users because they're just going to get the best products at the cheapest rates. Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research brought to you by the Atom Accelerator. If you're a developer looking for a new home in this industry, the Atom Economic Zone welcomes you. You'll hear more about the Atom Accelerator later in the show. Uh, today is June 12th, and we have a great interview coming at you with Sam McPherson, the founder and CEO of Phoenix Labs, which is a contracting development team that is building Spark Protocol. Uh, Spark is currently uh, operated by MakerDAO, and it is this interesting lending arm that they're kind of pushing the uh, the innovation of the lending operation for MakerDAO. So uh, we'll get to them later in the show. And as always, we are joined by two of the Blockworks Research Analysts to discuss what's happening in the markets, which right now... Uh, is not great. Uh, this week, we're joined by Effort and Matt. Um, you know, looking at asset prices here, Bitcoin and Ether are actually hanging in pretty nicely over the last seven days. Uh, Bitcoin's down about, or Bitcoin's actually up 1%, ETH down about 4%, but some of the alts uh, that we've come to know and love are absolutely nuked. Solana down 25%, Polygon down 23.5%. <laughs> Aptos, I don't know if they qualify into my know and loved category, but down 23%. It's, uh, it's been a rough one. Um, so honestly, at the, for this episode, we might have to put almost everything in the hot seat and, and start with, I'll, I'll go first and put crypto in the hot seat. <laughs> um, but I know we can, we can kind of do like a, a power round of uh, some of the madness that's been happening over the last few days. So Effort, I'll kind of throw things over to you. Yeah, so I have Gary Gensler on the hot seat today. Um, obviously, we've been talking, I think, a lot about the SEC. It's mostly a crypto regulatory podcast now uh, over the past couple of quarters just because of everything that's happened. Uh, but today, um, again, Monday, June 12th, House Rep Warren Davidson proposed a new bill uh, that he's, I guess, proposed in the House floor called the SEC Stabilization Act. And pretty much it, plan, it, it outlines a plan to remove Gensler as the SEC chair. And not even just that, but restructure the SEC to no longer have uh, a chair. And currently it has four commissioners that roll up to Gary Gensler as the chair. Uh, but in this future uh, structure of the SEC that's in, outlined in this bill, um, it actually expands the commissioner set to six. And instead of the SEC chair really deciding the rulemaking and enforcement investigations under the SEC's purview, these six commissioners... Uh, would actually have uh, say over like, again, everything I kind of outlined, the rulemaking, the enforcement investigations or what have you. And then there would also be an additional um, uh, chair or I'm sorry, an additional person called the executive director that really wouldn't have as much power uh, and rule with an iron fist that like Gensler is today with the SEC. Uh, this executive director, director would more so just really be there for like day to day operations and more of like a figurehead for uh, the SEC and less so of um I don't know, a monarch, which is what I feel like uh, Gensler is kind of running the SEC like today. So I don't really think that there's, I saw on crypto Twitter today, a lot of people were like, yes, this is exactly what we need. Um, but at the same time, like this is very early on in the House floor uh, or stages of becoming an actual law. Um, I doubt this actually gets any traction. Um, it's really, I guess it's good to see that uh, Congress is kind of seeing I guess much of the same that we're seeing in crypto. Like, obviously, we're going to be biased. We see things with our own view because we're bullish crypto. We want to see crypto here to stay in, in the United States. But I think it's nice to see that at least some people in the in uh, on the House floor are um, feeling the same pain points. Um, it's not just crypto, but I think there's been other concerns that Gensler as a whole has really threatened capital formation in America and capital formation and the rules that the SEC has laid out over the past 100 years has really made the United States like, the uh, financial epicenter of the world. Um, and obviously it starts with crypto, but there's a, a bunch of other things I think that Congress is overall overall like not happy with how Kepler has run the SEC. So um, again, I, I doubt it actually gets any traction. I doubt we lose him as chair, but it's very interesting to see that he is on the hot seat uh, with respect to the Congress. I've seen a lot of hatred towards Gensler, even outside of crypto. Like obviously pretty much everyone in crypto is, you know, not happy with him. I started boxing a couple weeks ago and I'm not going to lie. Like 
maybe picturing his face on those mitts has been a little bit helpful for me picking up the skill quicker. But uh, overall, like I think traditional finance, like I think a lot of people think the CFTC is who should be regulating crypto and that Gensler is overextending his reach and doing things he shouldn't be. And I think the, you know, it's getting to the point where it's like an inflection point for the general public's perception of Gen- of Gary Gensler. And hopefully, you know, it continues to trend the way it's going and everyone uh, kind of, I don't want to say picks up pitchforks or anything like that, but, you know, just uh, voices their concerns and problems with the current administration. At the end of the day, like he's not protecting anyone. You can go gamble. You could walk into a Vegas casino, take out a credit advance and go gamble all your money away. But yet, like, you know, allowing people to actually invest in cryptocurrencies that are decentralized protocols that a lot of them like actually remove middlemen and, you know, rent seekers and allow a more fair industry is oh so horrible. Obviously there's a lot of bad stuff in our industry too. I'm not anti-regulation, but you know, calling every cryptocurrency a security is just a, a ridiculous statement in my opinion. Yeah. And like just the way he's gone about it, you know, especially for like every time I see some ridiculous clip of him saying some obscene thing about crypto, you know, proof of stake, <laughs> For example, that video was just painful to watch. We can link that one in the description. But uh, for every video like that, there's a video of him saying something intelligent about crypto from his time at MIT. So it's just like very strange to see these dynamics play out. And I think this uh, this reaction by Rep. Warren Davidson kind of just highlights that actions have consequences. And you know, this country was kind of founded on checks and balances, and that's kind of what we're pushing for. This this specific position seemingly dodge the uh the majority of checks and balances to this point but um if you start start acting like an asshole people are going to come barking up your tree that's just kind of the way the world works so it's unfortunate for him but you know maybe this is a step forward that we need to take yeah just to add to that so matt you said that you can take out a credit line and go gamble all your money away i mean in the same sense like SPACs flourished under gensler's watch right and like majority overwhelming majority of SPACs that launched in 2020 are down like their crypto tokens that are unregistered securities in his purview. And it's like these SPACs, there's no investor protections with how those SPACs got listed and pretty much fell precipitously. Uh, obviously like Nikola, like the, the EV maker that ultimately ended up becoming a fraud, like that happened on his watch. Um, it's really easy to say that the SEC allowing a to be publicly listed, like Coinbase's argument is they approved our listing. They know what our business is like. So they allowed us to become a publicly traded entity. And the SEC is like, well, no, not actually. Like, we're just saying that you showcase the proper disclosures. We're not actually proving your business. And I'm not saying I want the SEC to kind of be more stringent with how they allow publicly traded companies to list. But at the same time, it's like, I feel like the SEC has done absolutely nothing to profess, pre- prevent investor uh, investors from getting fleeced over the past three plus years that he's been chair. Uh, and I know he's been chair prior, prior to that, but... Um, I just feel like there is no investor protections the way the SEC stood up today. I'd rather have zero regulation than what we've seen over the past few years. Because again, crypto, a completely unregulated industry in, in certain cases compared to securities and SPACs, like literally give me crypto. Because I feel like that at least has a, a true promise of the future. Um, and again, it just, it, it feels completely un- uncalled for with how he's handled this entire industry. It's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And like you and Effort, you and I have talked about this quite a bit, but like we keep trying to shove tokens and crypto crypto assets into this like square, like this just this, this rule book that doesn't make sense, right? Like I don't know the exact year that securities law was written, but what I do know is blockchains weren't even an idea at that point in time. And like the idea of the internet was hardly an idea and a realization. Like We're trying to use these ancient rules and I use, I guess, ancient quite loosely there, but we're trying to like shove this very new and emergent technology into the rule book of the past. And that is just not going to work. Like it's like the debate has always been, oh, is it a security or is it a commodity? Like, no, maybe it's something different. Maybe it's a token. So let's carve out its own class of rules that, you know, kind of benefit everybody and like, yes, create a fair and more reasonable environment or uh, protect investors to, you know, as, as that's the mandate we're supposed to be working towards. It's just like trying to take the existing rule book and, and apply it to this very new and emergent technology that has many new properties we've never seen before. It, 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 just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it's super, super frustrating to me. I don't want to belabor the point too much, but if you actually like, think about it, like I was one of the, er- I wouldn't say the earliest, but I was a very early user of Facebook when it was around back then, uh, or before it changed the meta when it was like just initially a social media platform. I was an early adopter of a lot of like web two tech giants and their products like Google in like the late nineties, early two thousands. I got a computer when I was like 
six years old in my house. And I remember Googling things like the promise of Web3 is like, if you're an early adopter of this technology, you should also be an owner of this because you were one of the major reasons why I was able to get to as big as it, it was back then. Being an early adopter should like give you certain benefits that today investor accredited investor laws like don't allow it. If I, as long as you uh, have less than a million dollar net worth, like, and there's, I think some additional rules that you have to like prove that you're educated enough to invest in certain, uh, you know, um, early tech uh, VC rounds and stuff like, you are pretty much blocked out. You're blacklisted from being able to invest and potentially create like generational wealth. So I feel like they're missing the point about like decentralized ownership, being an emerging, uh, an early adopter of this tech, like there is value add here and they're completely like missing the point. Like, yes, there's a lot of scams and, and fraud in this industry. So is there in every other industry in the world and there will be for the test of time. And like having a centralized regulatory body is not going to fix that. But what they can do is at least create a good sandbox that have some type of investor protections, but also allow innovation in America. And it's like, it, it's just so sad to see um, that they're just missing the point here. And also trying to bucket every crypto into one category is pretty ridiculous on its own. If you look at Dogecoin, you know, Dogecoin had no initial fundraise. Anyone could go mine it. It was basically being given given away for free on Reddit. If you were to say in that period of time that there was an expectation of profit, you're just lying. There wasn't. Like, no one thought that. Um, you know, the people who actually developed the currency sold it all quickly and were out completely. There was no, you know, third party promoter, like central entity that was you're relying on for expectation of profit. So it's like Dogecoin looks very different than maybe like a GMX or I don't know, whatever. Like all there's there's multiple different types of cryptocurrencies that should fit into different categories as well, which is something that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize. Like maybe some people realize, like, oh, Bitcoin and Ether are different, but everything else is the same. And it's like, that's not true either. There's at least a few different kinds. There's utility tokens, there's, you know, meme coins, there's whatever, there's multiple kinds of cryptocurrencies. Um, and then like back to your point effort, I remember last year, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a class with one of my finance professors, really good guy, smart dude. And he goes, why, why does the, you know, why are there these accredited investor requirements to invest in certain types of vehicles? And I'll raise my hand, like hundred person class or whatever. And I'm like, to keep rich people rich. And he's like, no, it's to protect, it's to protect them. And I'm like, you know, and then we get into the same art, like same conversation we just had. And I'm like, ah, but what about all these other things? You could go buy lottery tickets. Um, and yeah, just an interesting, an interesting conversation. Yep. Yep. Fair points. But that's enough regulation for the next six months. So, so Matt, what's, what's the next one we got on the list? I got Arbitrum in the hot seat today. Um, Arbitrum, unfortunately, had a little issue last week where basically it was unable to post transactions to mainnet. So reference the way Arbitrum works at a really high level is you send a bunch of transactions into this centralized thing called a sequencer. It's basically just a server. The server collects all the transactions, takes the important data from each, puts it together and sends it into Ethereum as one transaction that includes all the data from all these different transactions. Um, and that sequencer was not able to actually post those transactions to mainnet. So Arbitrum was technically, potentially, depending on your definition, down, meaning it couldn't reach finality. Similar to Ethereum, I'm not sure, we had a conversation about this probably a couple of weeks back, but Ethereum wasn't able to reach finality, meaning you had no way of knowing that your transaction was never going to be rolled back. It was never going to, you know, it, that it was something that was going to be forever immutable, going to be forever ingrained in this blockchain, um, which is one of the promises. But everything was functioning completely fine from the user perspective. So if you're if you're transacting on Arbitrum, you know you're still if you do a trade on Uniswap, you still end up it, from the user uh, experience perspective, you still end up exactly how you would imagine. There was nothing different that was going on. So whether or not it was actually down could be uh, up in the air. And this happened. This was a couple hours, so it only lasted a couple hours. And then the sequencer was you know fixed. There was a little bug. It was fixed, and uh, gas was added back into the sequencer so it's able to post more transactions to mainnet but it was uh definitely a interesting time that deserves a uh, comment for and probably a hot seat as well yeah for sure I'm, i personally would call this like degraded performance rather than down down to me feels like a very on off thing like a yeah it's like a it's either on or it's off and uh users were still unaffected they could still post transactions and still process like the, if you weren't like a tech savvy user, you would have had no idea the chain was you know in this state of degraded performance, um, and ultimately that's kind of why I lean that direction. So you're already getting soft confirmations from the sequencer it's in where it says, "Hey, I'm going to go post this transaction for you to the L1," but in the meantime, we'll tr pretend as if it's happened, um, and you don't actually get the hard confirmation until that happens. So if your hard confirmation is just delayed by a few hours, that's just 
an unfortunate scenario. Like again, this I would just consider that degraded performance. And I think the same thing for Ethereum when uh, it was struggling to reach finality due to a client it, client bug. That was the same thing. Like you could still get your transactions processed. You just didn't have the guarantee of finality, um, which kind of gives you the, a little more security in the you know irreversibility of your transaction. But uh, while you're still executing transactions to you know ninety percent of users. They're completely unaware. I'm, I'm just not willing to call that uh, down. But I'm curious, Effort, what's your take? Just suboptimal performance. Um, what I will say, though, and, and I've seen other people talk about this, too, obviously, is just like, how serious is it? Or how much of a de- how big of a deal is it that Arbitrum has a centralized sequencer? And I've seen um, a buddy of mine, Faultproof Ben, he works at Bankless. Him and I have like, DM'd about this a couple of times. He's, he's very much like you know, in the Ethereum community and the L2s. Um, and he doesn't think centralized sequencers are that big of a deal. And I feel like that's like the narrative that's kind of coming around in the Ethereum com- e- ecosystem. It's like, it's okay. You could just force include the transaction. It's no big deal. And it's like, that might be all well and good as a solution for somebody that's like a crypto power user. And I deal, I think I would coin myself a crypto power user. I've been in the space for six years at this point. I have no idea if the sequencer went down, how the hell they include my own force include my own transaction to the L1. It's like, first of all, that's not easy. That's not an acceptable answer. And like, we, we can't, uh, I think it just kind of lends itself to, even though this is like a suboptimal performance, obviously the Arbitrum team was able to get the sequencer back up and running. To your point, it had, uh, users had soft commitment and had no, I- no idea that this was even happening for the most part, unless you are just staring at RB scan like day in and day out. Um, but it, it doesn't change the fact that this should not be considered the end state of rollups. We have to get beyond this. It's not okay that one seek, one node on a on a chain can go down. It's pretty much running AWS on top of Ethereum. Like we got to get beyond this. Um, and him, you know, him and I, and I think a lot of other people in the community uh, on crypto, at least on crypto Twitter, have like really gone back and forth about whether this is okay. And I think it's okay in the interim, but I think from a regulatory and a technical perspective, and the overall ethos of decentralization, it's not okay. So like we got to do whatever we can to make these systems resilient. Um, but I, again, go back to answer the question. Like it wasn't down. It was really just suboptimal performance. Um, and yeah, that, they kind of, it ran how it should have. It was, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. So, so I know this is kind of a meme, but I think it does come down to social consensus. And I, I hate saying those words because, it, because of the way they've been used recently. But at the end of the day, like if you have an expectation of finality quickly and it's not, you know, you don't get that. I think that it can be considered down, but with Arbitrum, actually, like you don't really have an expectation besides that within 24 hours, your transaction will be posted to mainnet. So I agree with you. And I'm kind of asking to be roasted on Twitter for saying this, but with Ethereum, I think that maybe social consensus is you do have that expectation of finality, which means maybe you could consider it down, but you know, semantics, whatever. Um, I don't actually care at the end of the day. To the centralized sequencer point, like while I agree with you, it'd be amazing to have, you know, decentralized sequencer network, which would help with censorship resistance and liveness guarantees of these L2s. I I've really thought long and hard about it, and I don't see a design space that makes sense. Um, maybe you could have a, you know, a few sequencers, but each one's gonna still be centralized. Like when it comes down to it and it's it's turn to order and propose a block, which is how it works today. I think that it's uh, you know, there's there's not really a better design space, um, at least not one that's been proposed yet. Additionally, if we create better UI for doing things like forced inclusion, um, and you know, other different different L2s have different guarantees, but to make those guarantees reality of getting your assets back on mainnet, of kind of unwinding positions and getting assets back on mainnet, I think that that's actually a pretty pretty close to optimal solution. And not optimal, I think we have more room to grow, but. I don't think uh, we're we're getting decentralized sequencer sets. Honestly, Maybe, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't don't think so. Just to add to this quickly, like it also becomes an issue as more native assets are issued on L2s. So, like, I want to force include to an L1. That's great if I have Ethereum. That's not great if I have Grail, like a random like Camelot Dex, like their Grail token. I think is native to RB L2, and if Arbitrum went down forever, my token is completely worthless. So like it doesn't it doesn't matter that I can force include a transaction to the L1. So like I, I agree though I, it does go back to social consensus even though it feels like it, it's becoming a cop out answer like it very much does because these blockchains are really just technical solutions to get a community of of uh, of people to agree on like what the state is of of the world whatever that world is uh, for for each individual chain. Um, so I, I agree 
uh, Matt. I, I think it does come down to social con- consensus. And I do think that like you can argue very much so that Ethereum was more down than Arbitrum in this case. But I'm not giving it to you. It wasn't down, but it could be more down, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. That kind of sounded like a capitulation right there, effort. But uh, on, on keeping the uh, the social consensus wave riding, we have the Solana community discussing a potential hard fork. To be fair, I don't really think this is getting any meaningful traction, but nonetheless, we're bored on Twitter, and and this is what's floating around. So I'm curious to kind of get everyone's take on if that. What are the trade offs here? So it sounds like. The largely the reason why the community has just even brought this up in the first place is the fact that Alameda, um, the sister company of FTX, has around eight eight point two percent of the total token allocation right now. Um, and you know that's I guess that's technically owned by the creditors at this point. Definitely not Alameda or FTX, but nonetheless, the community still kind of sees it as this like burden um, that's kind of hanging over it. And you know we just saw the SEC name Soul Security in some of its recent lawsuits, so. Is this kind of like a acceptable way to migrate away from this, you know, dark cloud that's been hanging over them? I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, to some extent, I actually like the idea of removing Alameda's position of maybe like being able to even say that this new, uh, this is, you know, this is far fetched, but saying this new version of Solana, like maybe isn't a security or isn't what the SEC just deemed a security very recently. Um, I know that's, you know. Uh, probably lawyers would say that that's just not true. But anyways, like, uh, so I, I kind of like the idea overall, but I think it does provide some issues. Like, for instance, I think a lot about like if he, if Lido got hacked, Lido smart contracts got hacked and Ethereum had to do a, a rollback or would they do a rollback? Would that be the end of Ethereum? Would people just want to go to a chain that never did something like that? So I think something like I think that similar concept is true with Solana. I don't want to see any chains do hard forks that aren't complete, like, you know, that, that have any contra- controversy around them. I was around for the Bitcoin hard forks and BCH and BSV. And even though they ended up not being too big a deal, just like the amount of fear and widespread, you know, controversy going on in crypto at those times was just absolutely ridiculous. And um, I'd probably prefer to, to not have that happen again. There's no way that this happens, right? Like going back to social consensus. Who is Solana Foundation and who is, or Solana Labs, Solana Foundation, and USDC? Who, which fork would they support? There's no way they're going to support a fork that puts like legal liability on them to like <laughs> to pretty much deprecate the chain that Alameda and its creditors are, are have ownership in. Um, and if you don't have Solana Labs support, if you don't have the foundation support, Circles, and a bunch of other people that are supporting Solana today, like there's no way this fork will will have any success. Um, but it does seem like a, a highly profitable legal strategy. If every single time you get deemed a security, you just keep forking it. Be like, "That's not us, fam. We're we're we're, we're so classic. We're so classic uh, too." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, I, I tend to agree. It feels like a massive foot gun. Like you can't. Yeah, I don't know if there'd ever be be any recovering for Solana. To be honest, like you need that rallying point. You can't divide the community in any way, shape, or form, especially when it's shrunk to the size it is now for for all of crypto. And it just completely deletes your ability to to remain credible as this neutral base layer, um, which is really what a general purpose blockchain needs to be. So um, I would be pretty upset to see that. I'm, I'm rooting for Solana. It's it's kind of the you know the modular thesis has really taken over right now, and they're the ones putting their foot in the ground, being like, no, we're we're going to take a, a different approach. Um, so really excited to, that they're kind of leading the charge of that different set of innovations. Um, so yeah, I would personally be pretty upset to see them kind of make this decision. It just doesn't seem like the best move. But uh, over the last couple of minutes, you know, you guys have both mentioned your tenure in crypto and how you look at it. Things now versus then so i'm curious to get your take 2019 or 2023 which one is worse uh maybe matt i'll kick it over to you first definitely 2019 in my opinion um you know if you look at actual like you know percentage price drawdowns we're in a better position if you look at institution involvement like we have brevin howard we have jump we have countless other you know Drecken Miller, we have tons of support. Ray Dalio, like these aren't names of small entities like in 2019 that were involved in crypto. They're not people that are uh, unimportant to the rest of the world. In 2019, we had very few entities that were really, you know, ingrained in the global economy and global financial system, especially in the US financial system as well. Um, And now we just do have that. So I would say overall, like, don't get me wrong, like, 
I feel the horrible sentiment. Like it feels like the industry is dying, which by the way, is something that I had been waiting for, for a long time, um, as a uh, accumulation signal, but overall, like I do agree, like, you know, it feels terrible. It feels like we're in the depths of the bear market as far as sentiment, but, uh, yeah, 2019 was worse and 2014 made both of those look like absolute, uh, walks in the park, heaven, bull market, whatever you want to call it. So I'm uh, not too sad overall. Yeah, this is, this is my second bear market. So, um, was in the 2019 bear market in the depths of it. I took a break. I wasn't in crypto um, outside of just like personal hobby. It was obviously like really charismatic about it, but it was really difficult. I did take like a three to four month break uh, from crypto, like literally at the bottom. Unfortunately, I probably should have accumulated back then. I'd be a much richer man today. Um, but I honestly think now is worse. Um, I'm not sure if it's because I have more of my personal wealth in it. I'm obviously working full time in this space. There's obviously like a lot of higher risk at, at stake. But I also think in the 2019 depths of the bear market, you had this promise of DeFi starting to show its like starting to glimmer and like show itself. Like you saw Maker really start ramping up. You saw Ave Lend or, or ETH Lend back then and Compound like slowly starting to emerge and like this promise of decentralized finance, open financial rails. Um, and it, it, it was like, it was like a company pre-revenue. It's like the possibilities are endless. Like, yes, we're down here, but like there was something to look forward to. And even though there's like a lot of large institutions coming to the space, you're seeing regulation in, in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. And it sounds great. I sit here today and as someone that's very extremely bullish on, on the space as a whole, what I will say is this past cycle, we're, we're here today and like we created products that I think are really cool and novel, but I'm not sure if there's any actual real world demand for any of this. And that's scary. Um, and even though I do think there will be demand, I still see the promise of future uh, of, of uh, decentralized finance, uh, potentially ga on-chain gaming and whatnot, uh, and really democratizing ownership and access to uh, an open financial system. Um, it doesn't change the fact that like the right now it's very scary, especially being in the United States from a regulation perspective. Um, and sometimes all these products that we're building, it's still, there's definitely still a question back in my mind. like, is any of this worth it? And I'd be lying if I said that wasn't like a real question. So like, I think again, it's a combination of like stakes are higher. Uh, is the things that are being built today actually have real world demand in the future? Even though I do think it will, there will be, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, personally, I do think right now is worse than 2019. That same idea that you were getting at with like this budding sprout in DeFi at the end of the last bull market. Um, I feel like I'm seeing similar and you mentioned it, but I feel like I'm seeing similar with gaming at the end of this bull market and also on chain derivatives. So like, you know, the idea of trading with leverage on chain. Um, in a censorship resistant manner and maybe higher leverage, more assets, whatever. I think those two things are what gave me like a little bit of of a reminder of kind of what you're talking about, but I, I do, I do, uh, I do get what you're saying for sure. It's, you know, tough times. Well, that was depressing. So thanks <laughs> effort. Uh, let's, uh, let's try to end things on a, on a, on a better note. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I always like hearing those perspectives because it's not like for this industry, especially you can't just like pick up a textbook and read about the times. Like you got to scroll through old tweets or find old medium posts or like, you know, dig through old Kobe tweets. Like it's, it's hard to really get that type of perspective. So I always appreciate that. Um, but I got a, I got a cool throne for us to end it here. And there is someone winning from all this and it's foreign jurisdictions. So, you know, London is kind of leading the charge here most recently with a 16 Z announcing their first international office, um, going to be opened in London. And that's pretty interesting. So they, they cited the hostile U S crypto regulation basically as the reason why, they are considering elsewhere and London was very, uh, very open to them. And I think Rishi Shanak uh, is, I believe is his name is the UK prime minister. He was saying how he wants to be the home of web three um, and kind of just, you know, make a, a playground or a sandbox for this, this innovation. And that is like, as an American, that is super disheartening because that is, that's what we should be doing. That is, that is the no brainer move here. Being the country that takes the anti new tech stance that has never played well for anybody in the history of time. And so why do we want to try to change that? <laughs> like that's just, that's been a losing card to play and it's really painful to see us play it. Um, I guess like the positive spin zone here is that the large, one of the largest and most, you know, well-respected VC firms 
thinks that crypto is worthwhile enough to open its first international office. That's a pretty exciting thought. So that's kind of, that's what I'm telling myself at least. But, um, you know, Matt, I think you mentioned that there was some other regulation or jurisdictions that you felt were kind of like also in this, this category as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at Dubai, it's gaining such a narrative. I don't know if I actually, you know, I haven't seen A16Z's move there, like or any entities of that stature. So, you know, it's, it's reality. I'm not sure about, uh, it might, it, for all I know, it could just be the, uh, it could it could be a lot of posturing. I haven't seen the actual regulations to enable crypto companies to move there super easily yet. I think it's still pretty hard to get a bank account, if I'm not mistaken. But I would say also on like the optimistic front, glass half full, there's a reason the United States is where crypto still has such you know strong roots and tech in general. It's the homes of you know all the biggest tech companies in the world for the most part, um, and that's because we handled it so well with Web 2.0. And just because Gensler. And like, I don't even mean the SEC. I mean, Gary Gensler is going so anti-crypto and being so critical towards it. Doesn't mean that that's like going to be what stands. I'm I'm hoping we change course. And I, I'm thinking that there's a good chance we do. Uh, obviously, we're so deep into it that it's hard to not be nervous and upset and whatnot. But I think taking a bird's eye view that this isn't like something that's set in stone. It's not like the US is anti-crypto. So I'm a uh, I'm hopeful for the future. Probably a good time to jump over to the interview with Sam McPherson. But before we do, I want to give a quick shout out to the Atom Accelerator for sponsoring our show. Again, we're looking for all developers that need a new home or looking for an exciting place to build because the Atom ec- Economic Zone is looking more ripe than ever to, to be that location. So, you know, we talk about the importance of inter- interchange security on almost every other episode, it feels like. And you know, we recently talked to Stride and they're a prime example of what you can do leveraging that type of technology um, in culmination with IBC. Strides actually specifically has taken quite a few uh, strides, no pun intended, on improving the UX of, of IBC and, along with ICA's interchain accounts. So super exciting. Um, further to that, Neutron launching gives you the permissionless smart contracting platform uh, that kind of the you know DeFi ecosystem has really come to know and love. Uh, so that powered by native USDC coming through Noble would really be a huge game changer for the Cosmos DeFi ecosystem. So uh, the Atom Accelerator is rolling out grants um, on a monthly basis, ranging from 10000 to $1 million, um, looking for people that are willing to make an effort to change the status of Atom within the economic zone. So um, if that's you, feel free to click the link in the description to check out a little bit more about the Atom Accelerator. Now on to the interview with Sam McPherson from Spark Protocol. Awesome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We have a special guest, Sam McPherson, who is the co-founder and CEO of Phoenix Labs, which is a contracting development team building Spark Protocol. Uh, so Sam, thanks a ton for joining us today. We're super excited about this conversation. Uh, you know, I think we kind of need to start this off before getting into Spark Protocol and uh, kind of how everything's being built there and, and why those design decisions were made. Uh, we're really st- t- t- talking about the, the relationship that Spark has with MakerDAO. Um, and even before that, I feel like I'd love to get your take on, on the, at the end game. You know, it's made runes discussed it at length on a number of podcasts and a number of forums, but it, what's, how do you view this? Like, wh- how do you kind of put this in the context of, of where MakerDAO goes from here? And how would you kind of briefly summarize Maker's end game? Yeah. So um, Maker end game, I, I guess uh, one of the main points of it is that um, Rune is looking to lock down the core of Maker um, such that there's no major decisions there and it more turns into um, like routine, more like uh, bureaucratic, just making sure the rules are followed, that kind of thing. Very boring and move all the exciting innovation out to uh, what are called sub DAOs, which you can think of as kind of like uh, subsidiaries of, of Maker, but they're more, um, they are competitive as well. So uh, Spark Protocol was formed as a way to uh, dog food this whole process, basically. So um, the the protocol itself is uh, a lending engine that is um, connected to Maker through a D3M. So you get all the advanced uh, features of a modern lending engine. Um, so for example, like in Maker uh, uh, Core Vaults, you, know, you can only post collateral and then uh, borrow die. That's really the only thing. So. Uh, lending engines have evolved a lot since then, so you can uh, do things like uh, rehypothecate the collateral to get better yield as a lender. Um, you can do cross collateralization. Um, yeah, so various features like this. So Spark provides this all at the same time, providing uh, the best in class uh, liquidity that only Maker can provide. So by 
Um, dog food in this process, as before these sub DAOs are launched, we're able to get um, like pave the way to see what it looks like for future protocols that want to um, integrate into the end game and um, you know get access to makers' liquidity with their uh, awesome uh, products. Awesome. I, I love that uh, definition there you've provided. So Spark basically is one of these growth focused arms of MakerDAO. And so my understanding is it will, it will eventually kind of be amalgamated into a sub DAO. So what's this merger process look like? And how do you kind of d expect that to play out? Like, how does the acquisition actually occur by transitioning Spark from MakerDAO to a sub DAO? Yeah, sure. Uh, so us as Phoenix Labs, um, we are smart contract dev shop. So we're just one of the contributors to building uh, Spark Protocol. I would say one, we're the primary contributor right now, but it's, it's not just us. Spark Protocol is open to everybody. And so the ownership right now is under MakerDAO as a uh, temporary holder of the uh, product. Um, all the admin functions, for example, are under Maker Governance uh, for security reasons and stuff like that. There's no new DAO or anything like that. Now, when the sub DAOs launch, uh, the farming will uh, kick off and then there is no pre-allocation whatsoever. Everybody has equal opportunity to uh, post DAI um, and I believe post later uh, ETH and uh, Maker to get uh, the sub DAO tokens. And once they reach a uh, critical threshold, then they can start um, doing whatever they want. I mean, within certain limitations. So part of that will be uh, purchasing products that um, various ecosystem actors will be able to offer. So us as one such ecosystem actor um, building Spark Protocol, we can then uh, sell the product. If, if the sub DAOs want it, um, they can bid on it. So they can exchange sub DAO tokens for the product. But keep in mind, this is not compelled. So this is a completely voluntary uh, purchase of a product, in this case, Spark Protocol. And uh, yeah, so that that's uh, basically how it works in a nutshell. Gotcha. If we can take a step out a little bit, at a little bit of a higher level, Dan did a little bit more homework uh, on Spark than I did, admittedly. So I'll ask the dumb questions here. But can you kind of just explain what exactly Spark is and like what problem it's aiming to solve and what services it wants to provide? Yeah, sure. So Spark is a modern lending engine um, that is connected to Maker through what is called a die direct deposit module. So Maker will deposit uh, into uh, the lending engine, into the die market at a below market rate. Um, the rate is actually as low as possible. It's set to the die savings rate. It, no uh, borrowing um, sent out by Maker can go below that rate for a number of reasons, which I can get into if you want. Um, so the lowest rate possible is the die savings rate, and Spark is able to offer uh, users uh, die borrowing at that lowest rate. So um, this is going to be uh, basically it's it's the cheapest rate in DeFi. So uh, that's the value prop. You get to have all the features of a modern lending engine, cross collateralization. Um, you know you're able to take ETH shorts and stuff like that, um, as well as connected to uh, Maker's cheapest borrowing rates. And, and this is at scale too. So this is not just like some uh, small amount that can be uh, done through like yield farming or something like that. This is like we're talking hundreds of millions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've seen an early success for Spark with the initial cap of 5 million die being smashed in just three weeks. Uh, the vote to increase to 20 million, I believe, has passed. So that just needs to be executed at this point. Um, and I think we're marching on towards 200 million. So can you talk a little bit about why the DSR enables this lowest rate in DeFi? Like, why is borrowing DAI at the DSR always going to be the lowest rate? It's because of uh, if if you were to set um, a borrow rate that was lower, and Maker is the provider of this loan, then it opens up this fairly useless carry trade where users. I have some ETH sitting around. I stick it in Maker, I borrow at, um, well, but the DSR is about to go up to 3.5%. So let's say you can borrow at 2% after, after it goes up. Um, then I can just take my ETH, stick, uh, mint some DAI, and then stick it in the DSR. And this doesn't really benefit Maker at all, right? So it's like, it will increase the market cap of DAI, but uh, Maker's kind of paying for it. And it's like, these, these users will just go away as soon as the rates go up. So uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of why.
Yeah, and, and just to elaborate on that with an example for the listeners, basically, like imagine Ave had was b- allowing the borrowing of of Dai, which it does, of course. And let's say the market rate was currently two percent. Users could borrow at two percent uh, and then stake the Dai for S Dai and earn that three and a half percent. So you'd basically just be milking the spread between those two uh, those two numbers. And yeah, I agree that it kind of is a useless carry trade there. So and also I agree it's at the expense of Maker. Um, so you kind of expect the rates to across all of Dai lending markets to jump uh, to the DSR rate, and because of that, like, how do you think that affects other stablecoin borrowing, like USDC or USDT? Yeah, I, I think what's going to happen uh, next week, and I don't know if people are entirely prepared for this, but the rates across the board, and this would include USDC, that we have less, uh, uh, Maker has less of an effect on uh, Tether, I would say, but USDC due to the one to one swap and the PSM will be uh, raised as well. There's a lot of users who uh, take ETH, they'll mint uh, DAI, swap it to USDC and stick it into the, um, and supply it on Aave, for example. So that supply rate is currently about, you know, two, two and a half percent or so. Um, So these users, once they have a better opportunity uh, with DAI, um, they will um, switch to the DSR. And this involves pulling liquidity out of secondary lending markets such as Aave and Compound, which will increase the borrow rates. So we should see the supply rates be at least uh, 3.5%, which depending on the um, uh, interest rate curve that uh, Aave and Compound are setting, uh, should put the borrow rates um, yeah, more into the 5% uh, type uh, range. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty interesting as well. And that's kind of when you kind of look at different lending models, you know, MakerDAO as a whole uses like that more peer-to-protocol method where users come to the protocol to borrow DAI. Of course, Spark is kind of sitting in between that. So it's a little bit different there, I would say. Um, whereas something like Aave, which is truly a peer-to-pool model where suppliers deposit assets into a protocol that kind of in turn funds the the borrower's loans. Um, and so being in this peer-to-pool pool model, I see that you're kind of like beholden to these market forces and you don't really have any pricing power. Whereas Maker, for example, can come out and say, we're get, you know, we are doing some operations with RWAs. I th- we think we're going to earn our game plan is to earn five and a half percent. So we're going to offer a DSR of three and a half percent and kind of capture that spread as, as, um, as income for the protocol. So other peer to protocol models, like let's say Ave post go launch kind of, kind of have the same pricing power there in my head. So like I, uh, the game plan for uh, Ave is to initially have a bore rate of one and a half percent. I know Curve just launched its own stable coin. Um, it's a more of like a it's a pretty complex interest rate mechanism, but the rate zero on that, which is kind of like your equilibrium rate, if you will, uh, is closer to around the low three percent range. So I'm curious, like, how do you think this puts MakerDAO in a competitive position with other peer to protocol lending models? Uh, yeah, so for stable coins, um, the name of the game is demand, demand, demand. So like the supply side, although I, I'm, I'm really liking the innovation, like coming out of like Curve USD, for example, they've got a really uh, innovative liquidation model, it looks like. Um, but for the demand side, uh, that's been the hardest nut to crack. And like, I, I really, there's only three stable coins um, that have done it at a large scale, and that'd be USDC, Tether, and DAI, where... Um, you look at um, organic spot demand for the um, stable coin. This is users who are not just using it to get a yield. They don't have to be paid to hold the stable coin. These are users who are like using it as cash. They're holding it in their wallets, um, store of value. They're using it to pay people, that kind of stuff. This is the ultimate uh, goal of a stable coin, right? So DAI has uh, massive numbers here. We, uh, we use... Uh, 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 EOA addresses, uh, multi-sigs, look at this. People are just holding DAI and they're not like depositing it for yield as a, as a proxy for organic demand. And we see numbers of like three and a half billion in this demand, whereas um, like some of these others, like it's more in like the hundred million range. So like DAI is like, for, in terms of organic demand is, is far and above uh, the competition here. Um the fiat, uh, the fiat backed stable coins are, of course, much bigger. But um, yeah, it's, in terms of decentralized stable coins, DAI is by far ahead. Now, I think it, oh, I'm interested to see what happens with Go and Curve and all these kind of things, how they build demand. Um, you know, liquidity incentives seems to be the way to go to bootstrap that. But it's hard. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't know. Best of luck to them. 
Yeah, interesting. And so raising the DSR, I get like uh, also pushes up the borrow rate for some of these, uh, you know, on chain like assets like wrap stake, ETH and ETH, for example. And isn't that sort of like this, that sense or that create demand creation you're looking for is to take, you know, on chain assets, mint and mint die against the collateral? Or do you, is Maker really trying to push deeper into the RWAs and kind of go in all, go all in on that? Um, I wouldn't say Maker's going all in on anything. Um, Maker has a multi pronged strategy. Uh, of course, we are, or sorry, the Maker is very interested in, um, uh, decentralized collateral because it provides all sorts of resilience. So I, I really don't think Maker has this like, we need to just switch everything to RWA sort of mentality. Um, but the name of the game is, is demand, 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 demand on the, on the, on the demand, on like the stablecoin holder side. Uh, that's how you build a, a product that scales. So the DSR is, um, a way to bolster that. Uh, demand and uh, really uh, pay users for the yield that um, some of the other providers are just keeping for themselves. Like to me, this is just uh, user yield. Like the users should be paid for um, holding holding the stable coin instead of ju just all going to the uh, intermediary. So I want to talk a bit about like the plumbing of how the DSR actually gets paid. So. The protocol generates um, yield on its its assets that and that kind of flows through to the buffer surplus is my understanding. And then the the DSR rate is actually like I'm talking strictly like, you know, on a smart contract level, like how do the assets flow? And if I if I stake die for S die, I'm being paid by the buffer surplus. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. OK, so. You know, I, this is obviously like some extreme edge case that is just simply unrealistic. But like, what would happen if like the entire outstanding circulating die supply just all was like aped into the S die uh, contract? Would that like could theoretically the could the S die yield like drain the buffer surplus to a point where it would like create this bad debt scenario? Uh, theoretically, but that won't happen in practice because. The, um, on the revenue earning side, uh, we have a very scalable um, like return there. So as demand builds, um, we just scale the revenue with it. It's pretty one-to-one. -one. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And then, so the benchmark value, I think that was in the latest proposal was 5.5%, and that kind of led to a 3.5% DSR, roughly. Um, do you see a world where the DSR rises to be higher than like the T US T bill risk free rate? And kind of where do you imagine this you know equilibrium value resting for a DSR? Ah, it's an interesting uh, uh, thought experiment. So uh, yes, so right now uh, it's tracking um, the traditional finance rate, but um, we did have a or sorry, Maker had a positive uh, DSR in the past when there was. Um, and oversupply of uh, um, crypto leverage. So it was the inverse of what Dai's been since uh, March 2020, which is the demand side has outpaced the supply side. So this is why uh, USDC was onboarded because you need something uh, cash-like to fill that gap, basically. That. Um, so yeah, on the um, in the case where it was before, the um, crypto leverage was uh, in demand more than the holding die side. So the peg was uh, breaking down in that case. This is a long time ago. This is like when uh, multi-collateral die just launched. So for the first more months, this was the case. And the die savings rate was increased then. Uh, I believe it got up to about 5% um, to incentivize. Um, and the stability fee went up as well. So this was being paid by the uh, crypto uh, leverage users. So they were paying 5% and this was going to the holders in, in order to bring this number back in line, return the peg back to $1. So I could see a scenario uh, where we return to this potentially. Um, it, it's, it, it's hard to say though, because I mean, uh, crypto collateral as, as uh, the sole um, provider or as the sole collateral is hard to scale up to these numbers. So returning back to that kind of scenario, uh, I mean, it could be, but I would think it would. There would still be real world, real world assets on the balance sheet to a certain degree. So, uh, strictly, uh, I would say no. But yeah, for the foreseeable future, it will probably be uh, falling around this uh, tradfi rate. 
That's interesting because you keep saying demand, 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 and you also say like just crypto back collateral is really hard to scale. So real world assets are like a key component of that scaling strategy. Do you ever see a world where there is any under collateralization at all for a decentralized stablecoin? Like more on the macro picture, obviously we saw that go terribly with UST Luna. Um, but I'm just curious if you've thought about that at all in terms of the long-term game plan. Yeah, I mean, that's up to maker holders uh, ultimately. But personally, I, I don't think we should be pursuing that. DAI's uh, big, big strength is it's, it's over collateralization. If we start uh, going down this like under collateralized route, uh, like I, I think this is kind of a slippery slope towards what has like the fiat currencies that exist now. So um, I'm a big supporter of over collateralization as a fundamental rule of die. Now, maybe there could be something at the margins, but uh, for the for, for the vast majority, I, I think we should be striving for over collateralization. There is so many assets out there, like. We're far from tapping out the capacity. Okay, yeah, I kind of like that that thought process of like, let's focus on getting all the assets onboarded and then cross that bridge if we need it. Um, when you think about like peg, stabil peg stability mechanisms, obviously uh, Maker and Dai use the PSM, which I believe you actually created. Um, and then you look at something like Frax who uses AMOs, Curve is using these their peg keepers, which are quite similar to AMOs. How do you think about the, the, the trade-off between the two, like the the one-to-one -one PSM or kind of this more like smart contractual, a little bit of like under collateralization going on. It's hard to kind of define it. Like how do, how do you think about the trade-offs between the both both options? Yeah, I like the AMO model and I, I Maker is actually switching to more of that where it will be depositing on uh, AMMs directly rather than uh, the PSM. So the PSMs are actually going to be retired in the somewhat near future. And Maker will directly inject liquidity AMO style uh, to DEXs. Wow, awesome! No, that's that's super interesting to hear. I actually, I had no idea that was the case. Uh, what was the the design decision there? Like, what inspired that? Was it mostly just to kind of help shed some of that? Uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of discourse around being too backed by USDC, and during that last USDC DPEG, we saw. Um, die DPEG in a one-to-one -one fashion with, uh, excuse me, USDC. But you know, now thinking about that out loud, we also saw Frax do the same thing. Uh, yeah, so that uh, DPEG event was uh, certainly, it was a nice uh, test case to see where the faults were. And one of the faults was definitely that the uh, debt ceilings um, and uh, no kill switch basically on the, uh, any, uh, on the stable coins basically, pr primarily USDC, I would say. So We've, uh, or Maker has since taken action to add a kill switch in that if that happens again, uh, the PSM will just be shut off in that scenario because we do not, um, Maker doesn't want to be like this uh, lender of last resort for a true DPEG. Now, I, I was never worried about the USDC DPEG being permanent, but, um, you know, if and when something like, I mean, it's, it's, it's always uh, prudent to have protection against uh, any individual collateral um, failing. So yeah, design decision, um, there is a number of reasons behind this. Uh, DAI is, um, has had this one-to-one -one peg, um, but Maker's um, shifting strategies as part of the end game to have uh, DAI now uh, trade at a, a range as opposed to um, just this hard peg. So as part of that, um, depositing into DEX is, is, is a much better strategy. You also get uh, better uh, rates as you are no longer, the P PSMs were actually primarily just used as an arbitrage uh, mechanism with the DEXs. So instead of having this intermediary arbitrager, it makes more sense to just directly deposit and then, you know, Maker is the taker um, in these uh, market making side uh, thing. Right on. Yeah. And we see Frax do something similar, obviously, and they kind of use Curve as that home base with some activity on some other DEXs. Uh, do you think it makes sense to kind of have that main source of liquidity on one given DEX? And if so, like which DEXs do you think provide the best options for, for DAI? Not just one DEX. Uh, it should be really wherever the users are. The users decide uh, what they want to use and uh, Maker should just adapt and uh, supply liquidity to wherever the users are. On that same vein, so uh, I guess a competitive advantage I see of Spark is potentially being able to launch on different L2s and using the direct deposit module to kind of export some of that 
activity to L2s. Have you thought at all about that strategy? Like which L2s do you want to roll out to? What does the actual architecture look like? Like how does it work underneath the hood? Yeah, sure. We're, this is exactly what we're working on now at uh, Spark is um, we've got the uh, main net instance, but branching out to um, other chains is, is very important. Again, this is uh, all the, the same strategy, go where the users are. So the users are, are increasingly using L2s and other chains. So um, we want a Spark instance to be present. And we do the same thing uh, where with this direct deposit uh, module, uh, something similar to that, where uh, it will pre-mint the die and uh, move it across the native bridge in the case of the L2 and then deposit in the Spark instance. And then the rates are set at this uh, same DSR rate. So no matter what chain you're using, you don't have to worry about uh, the rate differences and like, you know, liquidity providers having to uh, arbitrage this and um, all this kind of stuff, you know, it goes away. It's very simple. Use the chain you want and borrow at the same rate. Is this pretty similar just for additional context to, to Aave's Go facilitators? Uh, yeah, actually, the model is kind of similar. So um, Maker's original design uh, bundled the vault engine. Um, it is fairly tightly integrated. Um, you know, it, it, I am not faulting the developers. I think it's it's really hard to build this stuff like for the future. I think they did an amazing job. But uh, in retrospect, I think it, it's better to just have the stable coin and then um, it can attach the um, asset side of the balance sheet. Uh, to whatever. So lending engine is is just one of the things. And I think this is what uh, Aave is doing. They have uh, Aave, um, their lending market as one of the facilitators. And then they have, um, uh, what is it? Just a flash mint, I think is the other one. And presumably they'll add like real world asset. Um, but yeah, this, this is very similar to uh, the restructuring of Maker in the end game, where uh, the balance sheet allocation will be delegated entirely to the sub DAOs. So there's going to be four uh, sub DAOs that are spe specifically for allocation of the balance sheet. So they will be given, they'll have access to mint uh, die, and then they can um, use that die and just stick it into whatever investment opportunity uh, gives the best return. You know, there's lots of caveats they have to deal with like, um, keeping things, uh, keeping the peg liquid, all, all this kind of stuff. It, it, there's a lot of nuance, but generally speaking, yeah, the the best return um, wins, and the the uh, allocator DAOs will compete uh, to allocate the balance sheet uh, because they get a cut of the profit. Okay, that's pretty interesting and well as well. And, and Spark's doing some more cool things around fixed rate lending. Why do you think that this is kind of like a missing piece from DeFi and how is Spark really working to enable this? Uh, I believe you're working with protocols like Element and Sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, fixed rate lending is like a huge market in TradFi. And um, I think I think it's just because we're early. It just doesn't exist yet. It may be like uh, the rates are so volatile in DeFi, like, you know, <laughs> getting a fixed rate for like six months. It's like an eternity, like. Who's taking the duration risk on the other side of that? Um, you know, it, it's it's tough. So, but I think this is as the ecosystem matures. You know, introducing fixed rate primitives is like a next logical step. So, yes, we're working with um, Element Sense. Um, they're building their products um, such as Element Hyperdrive, um, to which we can uh, integrate with. Uh, as Phoenix Labs, we can help uh, facilitate the integration. With makers, so they can get these. Um, the allocator DAOs can then allocate uh, to this as a uh, potential um, investment opportunity. Yeah, it's, that's that's almost like the the world of TradFi runs on fixed rate lending. Fixed rate lending, so it'll be fun to see that come on chain and. You know, I've seen you talk about how this kind of defines a yield curve for Dai, and why is that important for Dai, and how is that going to impact the broader DeFi space? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I think. Because DeFi has actually chosen to denominate itself in the U.S. dollar, uh, I think it's actually going to eventually just import the yield curve from TradFi, and then you can just trade it in DeFi rails. And this isn't like any enforcement. I think this is just going to naturally happen. And it's not because like there's any special thing about the U.S. It's because uh, everybody has chosen to denominate in the U.S. dollar. So it just kind of naturally gravitates uh, to that decision. So... There is really no yield curve in DeFi right now, but uh, having fixed rate lending will uh, bootstrap this mechanism. And I think it's only going to uh, grow and converge on the traditional finance space as we import uh, more primitives. 
So I've noticed personally just over the last few months, a lot of uh, protocols popping up specifically focused on either on-chain uh, treasury yield or on LST back stables. So like they're really focusing on these two different niches, whereas MakerDAO, it kind of feels like they're trying to tackle, you know, both of those things in the same vein. Um, would you say there's pros and cons to either strategy? Like why is MakerDAO kind of making the decision to go for both and, and maybe what advantages does it bring? Um, I would say Maker's not really pursuing an LST strategy. Uh, that was previously uh, kind of put out there, but um, that was pulled. I think you're talking about EtherDAI. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, canceled in the Maker's plan. So Maker is uh, just focused on um, these uh, treasury yield uh, strategies. Um, so yeah, I mean, just because the rates have been so high, there's like a huge um, economic uh, force. Um, you can think of it like, so let's go back a year ago or maybe even half a year ago. Um, there was like this huge gap between uh, traditional finance rates and DeFi rates. DeFi rates had cratered um, because we were you know, in the middle of a, bear market, um, TradFi rates skyrocketing, but this this difference, and again, because we're denominating in uh, US dollars in DeFi, um, this is a massive economic incentive for uh, somebody to tokenize uh, this treasury yield and put it on chain. And this is why you're seeing an explosion of these protocols, um, you know, Ondo finance, back finance, um, Maple now has a pool, I believe. So like, there's all kinds of uh, different solutions coming online. And this is uh, precisely just because uh, this economic, um, it's like a discontinuity in uh, economics. And so it needs to be bridged. And so these protocols will reap the benefits by being the first to bring these uh, tokenized treasuries on chain. And then all of DeFi benefits um, as we get more access to more primitives in DeFi. And it almost seems like there's kind of like a, a convergence with the ideology of every protocol. Not every, but, you know, we've seen, we've talked at, at length about how, you know, Frax is doing some some similar things and Aave is now launching a stable coin. They have their lending market and Curve is kind of in the same boat. And Frax has spoken at length about the trinity between the stable coin, a lending market um, and on-chain liquidity even like a DEX or, of some capacity. So do you think that these protocols will just continue to vertically integrate until you've kind of like reached that max capacity or like, you know, we kind of saw this, like the original state of DeFi was everybody specializes and does one thing, but the, the landscape seems to have changed. What's your views on that? Yeah, absolutely. Everything's going to be vertically integrated. Uh, I think it all comes down to, um, I mean, this, this is a really good thing about DeFi, I think, is that it, uh, there's very little moats actually. So the uh, users are going to get all the benefit of this. Um, things are highly competitive and uh, they'll, the margins are just going to drop to zero in the long run on basically everything. Um, where there are moats, I think, uh, turns out to be branding to a large degree. Um, that, and I would say um, demand for stable coins. And this is why everybody's launching a stable coin, because they've realized that uh, with all the other products, DEXs and lending, you're at the mercy of LPs and you have to pay them the vast majority of the revenue. The stable coin is the only one uh, where the protocol uh, can direct the revenue to different things. So uh, this is what everybody's coming to the realization for. This is why they're all launching a stable coin. And I think, yeah, everything's just going to be vertically integrated in the end. You know, everything's open source code. Uh, and I think this is ultimately a good thing for the users because they're just going to get the best products at the cheapest rates yeah no i mean that makes a ton of sense it, owning the whole stack kind of gives you uh, that more the you know the flywheel term that always gets uh, tossed around but it, it's true <laughs> you can kind of feed your your other arms um yep. and speaking of like you know on that DeFi lego narrative uh spark was actually built off of a fork of Aave v3 what was the kind of reasoning for not building a custom solution and kind of saying hey like let's just leverage what's already exists and uh, i know there's like a profit share agreement with Aave. if you can speak to like what, what were the terms of the final agreement yeah sure um so the decision um i mean i guess i would ask why would you build your own when there's existing open source software that's really great like the Aave team has done an exceptional job building Aave v3 code base. Um, it's one of the best code bases I've seen in the space. It's battle hardened. Um, it's, yeah, it's been, it has huge Lindy effect. So and there's lots of integrations with it. Uh, so like by using um, the same code base, 
um, we get lots of uh, integrations just out of the bat because people just uh, take their uh, integration with Aave v3 and then just point it to new contract addresses. Um, yeah, so we're a big believer in uh, open source and you know everybody's sharing and we open source all of our code. Anybody's free to use it um, and you know pay us or don't. It doesn't. Uh, it's not up to us. But yeah, we felt as uh, we want to. Um, encourage a positive uh, feedback with this kind of stuff. So uh, we did not have to pay Ave Dao. There's no requirement to do that, but uh, we want developers to be paid uh, for the work that they do. So um, well, there's um, very interested in things like retroactive public goods funding, stuff like that. I'd like to see more experimentation in that regard so that the open source developers that are doing all the hard work get compensated for that work and incentivizes uh, more of this work. Um, but in the meantime, we felt the most prudent thing to do was just to, you know, uh, pay Ave Dao for the uh, work that they've done. And so we have an arrangement with them to pay them 10% uh, of the profit uh, that goes to the uh, Spark SubDAO when it's merged um, for two years. And Ave, we, we sent that to Ave Dao and they've accepted with overwhelming support. So we feel it's just a very positive some way uh, to go about this. I love that that mindset of really kind of, you know, leveraging what already exists and uh, doing it in an appropriate way. That's like kind of positive sum. The, the, the narrative of, you know, rising tide lifts all boats is, is commonly touted throughout DeFi. And this is a great example of kind of how you guys are, are participating in that. I want to take a step back, though, to one of our earlier conversations about how kind of exactly how this like acquisition or merger, whatever you want to call it, goes from the from spark with as it pertains to spark protocol from MakerDAO to the sub DAO, like basically how the transition occurs um and so you'd be using these sub DAO tokens to acquire the protocol um and both of those things kind of have like an up in the air fair value in my mind like how do you truly define how many tokens should be given to MakerDAO for Spark Protocol? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So it's uh, like a normal uh, bidding process. So there's four uh, sub DAOs that can bid on acquiring products. And um, we would just throw out a price. Um, like if one of the sub DAOs wants it, if none of them want it, you know, it's up to them. And this is just sort of classic negotiation. So uh, presumably we'll go back and forth uh, a few times. Um, what exactly that looks like because it's a DAO, um, I'm not sure yet, but we're we're going to find out, I guess. If, let's say each of the four sub DAOs are interested. There'd be like this bidding process effectively. Um, definitely excited to watch this play out now. And like, would MakerDAO be more interested, like just objectively speaking, like from between one sub DAO's token versus another? Like, are they all this equal at onset? And then, of course, as the sub DAOs evolve and do different things, maybe the tokens are have different uh, meanings of value. But for, from the original onset, like why would MakerDAO favor one sub DAO over the other? Uh, yeah, they don't. They're born equal. And uh, this is a very interesting design uh, that came from Rune, uh, where he calls it born decentralized, where it's it's there's no pre allocations whatsoever. So it's literally emergent from those users that. Uh, have the capital and want to, they just pick them. Like, I want to go into this one. And in their mind, maybe they have an idea of what it should look like uh, after the initial farming period is done. And then the sub DAOs, they'll all have a bit of a personality after this. You know, maybe whale A, whale B, certain number of uh, smaller users are in one particular or another. They're active on the forum because they're uh, farming that token. So they're actively trying to. Uh, persuade people to go in some direction. Um, and then once the voting kicks off, uh, these personalities kind of form and uh, they can adopt branding, products, uh, whatever. They're uh, completely autonomous to do. Uh, it's not whatever they want, but like within certain uh, constraints that maker sets, they're free to adopt their own brands and uh, products and whatnot. And there could be multiple products. So it's not just Spark Protocol, like uh, Anybody's free to build uh, what they want and pitch it to these sub DAOs. I was just curious. So, like, I view Maker as kind of like the on chain circle, if you will. So, like, when treasury bills or, or yields are going up, that's obviously really good for Circle's business. And then when they're down, um, maybe it's less so good. So, I guess, how does Maker's strategy 
uh, both benefit from rising interest rate environments by increasing revenue for the protocol, but then also on the other side of things, when maybe we get a bond bull market and, and uh, rates are going down, how does Maker continue to make profit? Uh, yeah, so this is the strength of multi-collateral DAI in that there's, uh, we have, or Maker has like every kind of asset basically on earth in the long run. So um as the interest rates go down, it will kind of drive more probably bullish behavior, um, eventually at least. And then uh, Maker was making uh, fairly good returns when the bull market was on because uh, people were just leveraging with no no limit. And um, to, when the market gets too hot, you have to uh, raise rates a bit to kind of cool down the insanity. So there's uh, returns there. Um, yeah, it's really like an all-weather type of situation. Um, we haven't gone through like a low interest rate recession yet, so that might be interesting. I'm not sure what that will look like. Um, I feel like that's just bad for everybody. So, you know, nobody wants a, a recession, right? Yeah, I strongly agree there. That would be a really interesting scenario, though, one that I actually hadn't considered. So I'll I'll be watching closely over the next, if that, if that could take five, 10 years. Who knows? We might be waiting a while. But uh, anyways, I, this was a fantastic conversation, Sam. I know you got a hard stop here coming up uh, in the next 20, 10, 10, 10 minutes. So I just wanted to hand it over to you to share with people where they can learn more about Spark, learn more about you. Uh, and any other closing thoughts that you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so if you want to get involved in, um, I would say the SubDAO is the important place to go. Um, there is a forum open up on the Maker Forums called uh, SubDAO 2. It's a bit weird, I know. Um, so there's like six SubDAOs. We just kind of are posting in, in the one under uh, Spark and Friends kind of uh, uh, setup. So you can go to the forum, uh, post your protocol or if you're interested in helping, you know, it's, it's wide open. Um, just get involved. I, I really, I really think um, makers had this past where it's kind of been a little closed off uh, from the outside view. Um, people find we're finding it hard to onboard. Well, like what's the process for onboarding my collateral and whatnot. Um, and I think a large part of this is because it was so um, big and like everything's all together. A lot of the arguments just turned very political in the DAO. So um, it just became very bureaucratic and like messy and not that great. Now, the end game, um, I think, really flips this on its head. So uh, these are going to be smaller teams, many of them. And you just you you pick the uh, sub DAO that you want that vibes with you. Right. You know, you don't like real world assets go into a decentralized collateral uh, sub DAO. And that, that's what we're more focused on. Um, you like um, meme coins, I don't know, like it could be anything. And because there's so many um, sub DAOs, you can kind of just pick and choose and go into the uh, memes that you like, um, for lack of a better term, I guess. Uh, so yeah, my message would be, there's really a new ground floor that you can get in on with Maker. It's, it's no longer the old school conservative uh, boring place that it used to be, it's you can get in on the ground floor and really uh, shape the future of Maker. So that would be my takeaway message. Yeah, with all the infrastructure and, and battle-tested uh, resume, I guess, that Maker has developed to date too, I feel like that's an absolutely incredible opportunity. So I would urge people to get involved as well if they're interested. Um, but again, Sam, thanks so much. Let's do this again in six months or so to get an update on Spark and, and where MakerDAO is at because I'm sure this stuff is going to change really quick. But again, thanks for coming on. 